actually helps. Just yeah. a wee bit. Let's Just do a everlasting job, then we'll Oh, I better check my mask off then. <laughs> For every worry that troubles our hearts, we have a name that is higher. For every fear that has caused us to doubt, we have a name that is higher. Powers that come to destroy our belief, bow to the greater authority. Empty religion, beware and take heed. The name of Lord Jesus is higher. His is the name that can strengthen and heal. His is the name to which we kneel. Oh, the shalom, you're the God of our feet. We lift your name even higher.
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the church, and welcome if you're uh, listening <clears throat> at home. Uh, we're going to start off this morning's service um, with a time of worship uh, and prayers, and um, I want to invite you this morning to engage uh, in this time of worship. It's, it's obviously difficult if you're in the church because you're not allowed to, to sing, uh, but at the risk of sounding like some sort of TV game show host, do please join in if you're at home. Uh, you can sing along uh, as we go. So, um, but <laughs> the point is, wherever you are uh, and whatever you're allowed to do, I would encourage you all to, to spend this time, not as a spectator, um, you know, this isn't a performance, um, but I'd like you to involve yourselves uh, in the worship by focusing on the words of the songs. There are some great words in the, in the songs that, that, that I've chosen this morning um, that, uh, that really talk to us about God's greatness, uh, his dependability, how we can rely on him, and how we can come to him uh, you know, wherever, wherever we're at in the world, uh, whether, whether we're going through great times, we can, we can be thankful and praise him, or whether we're going through difficult times um, uh, and, uh, and we need... You know, someone to lean on and to support us and to know that his love is there for us. So uh, if you focus on the words of the songs, be reminded of the truth of the gospel, uh, that Jesus you know, died for us uh, and that we have a place in heaven through him. Uh, and in, in, in our hearts and minds, let's give to God um, the thanks, uh, the glory that, that he deserves um, as we sing these songs. So uh, please, please do feel free to stand or sit as you want. Uh, certain peer pressure to, uh, to stand up if everyone else does around you, but uh, I won't take offense if you want to just uh, sit there. Uh, just uh, smile behind your masks, that'll make me feel better. So uh, uh, if I could start with some words, though, from Psalm uh, 145 that, uh, that sets the scene uh, for that. Uh, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger. He's rich in love. The Lord is good to all. And he has compassion on all he has made. All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of, your, of the glory of your kingdom. They will speak of your might. So that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving towards all he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfies the desires of every living thing. I'm going to start by singing a song that uh, echoes that. Everlasting God, the years go by, but you're unchanging. Everlasting God, the years go by, but you're unchanging. In this battle, Yeah. 
faithful. We are faithful and we will trust in you. Yes, Father God, you are the God of our peace. You are the one who gives us peace in our lives in the midst of all the turmoil. We lift your name this morning. We praise you. We praise you with all our hearts. Well, 
Lord, we thank you that you welcome us, that you look at us and say, these are my children, come, come to me, my children. We thank you, Lord, that you have torn the curtain in two, the way into your presence is open, and we are totally welcome. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Before you, we 
desire to be in your presence. That's where we long to be. To be in your presence, to sit at your feet, where your love surrounds me and makes me complete. This is my desire. This is my desire, this is my desire, to rest in your presence, not rushing away. To cherish each moment, here I would say, this is my desire, oh Lord, this is my desire. This is my desire, oh this is my desire. Let's just rest quietly in God's presence. Let's focus on Him this morning. Him for the wonderful things he has done for us in our lives, for the way in which he welcomes us despite our simple nature, despite everything we might have done. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to us. Thank you for giving us that pathway to you so that we can indeed rest in your presence and have a relationship with you and your mighty God. To be in your presence, to sit at your feet, where your love surrounds me and makes me complete. This is my desire, oh Lord, this is my desire, this is my desire. Stay in the presence of our Lord as we come to him with our prayers this morning. So let's pray together. Lord, we come to you this morning to praise your name. You are the almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, ruler of all things, and for whom nothing is impossible. And yet you're also our loving heavenly father, abounding in grace and mercy for your children, whom you loved so much that you chose to die in our place 
so that we could renew a relationship with you. So Lord, we come before you this morning in humility, reverence and thankfulness for all that you are and for the fact that you live in and with us through your Holy Spirit. Help us never to forget just how amazing it is that we can be in relationship with you. Teach us how to live lives which honour you and bring your love and your light into the world in which we live. Lord God, we thank you that just as Jesus chose his disciples when he was here on earth, that we too have been chosen. We've heard your call and responded, and we're here to serve you today. We lift to you the church worldwide, and thank you that we can be united through Christ. Thank you that we are free to worship you and that we're able to come together here physically this morning within this building and also online. But we bring before you all those who are not safe, those who are persecuted for their faith, those for whom even speaking the name of Jesus puts them at risk of torture or death. So, Lord, we pray for your protection over those who seek to spread your gospel, even though it means danger or hardship for themselves. And we pray for our mission partners here at Winchester Baptist. We pray for Ian and Emma, for Becky, for August, and for Heather and Barry. And we ask that you will provide all that they need, practically and spiritually, as they serve you around the world. And we pray especially for the growing nation's 40 days of prayer, that this will be a time of renewal, refreshing, direction and empowering of your people to see and do your will. And Lord God, just as we can be brought together through your love, we're so aware of the divisions and disagreements that so often get in the way of the reason we are here. Lord God, we give you thanks that you understand our relationships because you are God in three persons, united in love and perfect understanding. Forgive our failures to love and understand as you do and help us to learn to be more like you. Lord, help your church to be all that you want it to be working together in unity, knowing that we are all your servants. We are called to be set apart to serve you. So help us to keep you at the front and centre of all that we say and do, that your church will shine brightly, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. We ask that you will bless Marcus and the leadership here at Winbap, as well as the leaders of all the churches in our city. Each of these people have their own needs as they face life's challenges and celebrations. And we ask that as they lead and minister to your people, that their own needs will also be met, that they will feel loved, supported, challenged and excited. But most of all, Lord, we ask that they will always feel you close and that your voice will be the one that they hear clearly. And Lord, as the pandemic still causes so much disruption around the world, we thank you for the vaccine and the progress that's been made both here and in other countries. And we lift before you the government's plans here in the UK for the next part of the roadmap. So many are anxious to know what the decision will be and when it will be made. But Lord, we know that these decisions are never easy. And whatever way they go, there will be people and situations that will be adversely affected. So Lord, we ask that you will be with the decision makers, that they will be influenced by you and that whatever plans are made, will be made with the safety and good of all at heart. 
And Lord, we bring before you countries where the vaccine is still such a long way off and where hospitals and healthcare systems are under immense strain. We think particularly of India and Nepal and for war-torn areas such as Yemen and Syria. And we lift before you the world leaders and decision makers and ask that you will lead the way in ensuring that all of your people find a way through these challenging times. And God of creation, we thank you for the lovely weather we have enjoyed over this last week. It's brought such joy and much happiness to be able to feel the warm sun on our faces and to enjoy gathering together with family and friends outdoors. But we bring before you those places where the things that we take for granted, such as clean water, sanitation, food and shelter, are so far from reach that disease and sickness is of great threat. Help us, Lord, to know how we can make a difference how our behaviours and choices impact changes to the world's climate. As we enjoy the beauty and the many blessings of the world, teach us to respect the earth as your creation, that we may use its resources wisely to your glory and for the good of all, knowing that you have made us stewards of this wonderful planet that we call earth. Lord, we know that we are an imperfect group of humans, but we pray that by your guidance and power, we may be faithful in the work that you have given us to do in your world. Help us to be a transformed people who can bring your hope to those whom we meet. Let us not selfishly search for the fulfilment of our own ambitions, but be in tune with your plans and purposes. Show us your presence in our situations. Teach us the relationships that you value so that you are honoured and glorified in all that we do. For we ask this in all our prayers in the precious name of our Saviour Jesus. Amen. And uh, just before uh, Bridget brings us our reading and um, Martin uh, at the word, uh, we're going to sing one more song, which is, where do we look? Where do we look for our strength? Where do we look for our help? God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom to know just what to do. I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you. I will love you, Lord, my rock, for heaven and all my days. I will love you, Lord. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision. To see things like you do, God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord. I will love you, Lord, my rock, forever, all my days, I will love you, Hallelujah, our God 
Beginning at verse 37, Luke 11, verse 37. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee, noticing, noticing that Jesus did not first wash before the meal, was surprised. Then the Lord said to him, now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But give what is inside the dish to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God the tenth of your mint rue and all other kinds of garden herbs but you neglect justice and the love of god you should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone woe to you pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplaces woe to you because you are like unmarked graves which men walk over without knowing it one of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Jesus replied, As you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it is your forefathers who killed them. So you testify that you approve what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. When Jesus left there, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. This is the word of the Lord. Good start. Cheerful little passage, isn't it? Thank you, Marcus. It's like looking out at a gathering of bank robbers. Sorry. Um, good morning, Winchester Baptist Church. Um, and thank you, actually, uh, once again, uh, because it is a privilege to share a few thoughts with you arising from this morning's Bible passage. Now, I was asked to speak on this passage some months ago uh, when the series was being planned, 
and unusually for me, I wrote the sermon two weeks ago, nearly, um, which means that this knows nothing of events that may have transpired this week, uh, which led to the open letter that many of us got in our emails um, this week. Um, and I honestly did consider changing the whole thing. Um, but I was reminded um, by my wife of what Paul Hills, who was a former minister, said to her when she was debating on whether she was actually going to say what she wanted to say in the sermon, that if you believe you have heard from God in your preparation, then you must not change what you are going to say. So then. We've been following a series entitled Eating with Jesus, looking at various meals recorded in the Gospels. And this particular meal marks a distinct turning point in how Jesus is treated. Um, his mealtime conversation causes a distinctly negative reaction. Now, I would love to tell you that this is a difficult passage to interpret. But actually, it really isn't all that difficult. The difficult bit is working through what the likely application to our lives today is. Jesus has been teaching the crowds and his disciples. He's just finished um, introducing them to a pattern of prayer that we generally call the Lord's Prayer. And he's just told the crowd, in no uncertain terms, that they are a wicked generation and shouldn't be asking for signs when they ignored the prophets. And he repeats the parable about lamps and whether they are better under a bucket or on a lampstand. And verse 37, when he had just finished speaking, a local Pharisee invites him to dine at his house. And Jesus goes in and he reclines at the table, uh, which was the fashion. Uh, so far, so good. Now, we're not given any motive for the Pharisee's invitation, although several commentaries would like to imply one. Um, Jesus has already had a few run-ins with the Pharisees um, who've been checking out his teaching. Uh, but to date, they are probably not entirely disappointed. Uh, for a start, Jesus isn't a Sadducee, who the Pharisees don't like. Um, and he also believes in the resurrection of the dead, which they do too. Um, but then, raised eyebrows all round. Jesus doesn't wash his hands. Okay, a word or two about this problem. Firstly, this is not a parental instruction like wash your hands before dinner. Uh, nor is it uh, anything to do with COVID. It has nothing to do with personal hygiene whatsoever. Um, did Jesus forget this ritual? Or is he doing this on purpose? Well, from my reading of the Gospels, I, I, find, I don't find Jesus doing much by accident. Um, and this is the equivalent of throwing a rock at a wasp's nest. Right? It's very unlikely to produce a calm and measured response. Um, this is an important ritual, this washing of hands. Um, everybody in the society knows this. And, and actually, they aren't pretending it's anything else. Um, it was a originally a requirement for priests. But then various rabbis taught various things, and, and it got extended so that it was a rule for everybody, for men and women, before they ate a meal. It was a ritual. It was designed as a ritual. And you carried out the ritual whether your hands were actually clean or not. Um, to follow the ritual, you would take a jug of water and pour water from it over each hand in turn. Um, twice on each hand, three times if you were really keen. Um, and if you were right-handed, then you started holding by holding the jug in your left, because that, slight, that feels slightly more uncomfortable. I'm left-handed, so it doesn't feel remotely uncomfortable. Um, but if you were left-handed, you did it the other way around. And that was to remind you that it was a ritual. And then a blessing was said. Anyway, the fact is, Jesus doesn't do this. 
when presumably everybody else does. And this is noted with surprise. Now, we're not told that anything was actually said to Jesus about this, but Jesus launches into actually one of the most serious attacks he makes on the Pharisees and their priorities. Now, the Pharisees had some very specific beliefs that set them apart from some of the other Jewish religious groups of the time, like the Sadducees. Incidentally, the Pharisees and the Sadducees hate each other. Uh, in fact, the name Pharisee, which means separatist, was a derogatory nickname given to them by the Sadducees. A bit like the word Christian was originally an insult. Um, Pharisees believed in a number of things, as did Jesus, including the resurrection of the dead, angels, heaven, the coming Messiah. And they also believed that along with the written law, capital L, the Torah, given to Moses on Mount Sinai, alongside this, God had also given a, a, a verbal and oral law, which, were, which had equal status. It was just as important. And both the oral and the written law had to be interpreted so that you could live it out in normal life. For instance, an eye for an eye um, was not to be interpreted absolutely literally. You were not to literally to go around picking people's eyeballs out. Um, it was possible for some other form of restorative justice to be applied. And the Pharisees themselves were not mostly from the priestly class, um, but within the group there was a hierarchy. And, and those who interpreted the law, the lawyers in this passage, um, were looked up to. And it's really important, I think, to, un to realize that the Pharisees understood themselves as preservers and protectors of their faith. They would see themselves as the moderates of their day. Um, they have not set out to misguide people about God. In fact, they very clearly believe they are committed to providing helpful, clear scriptural instruction and specific guidelines developed from it about how to not become unclean and thus maintain a good relationship with God. Well, I think it's fair to say Jesus is not getting a return invitation because he sets out a series of charges against the Pharisees. That horrifies them. In, in most modern translations, they start with the word alas. Slightly older translations use the word woe. Um, I'll try and summarize them as best I can. You don't get it, do you, says Jesus. You think it's all outside stuff, and that inside stuff doesn't matter. But exactly the opposite is true. You think it's more important to get your rituals right than it is to care about justice and compassion for the poor. You rather like keeping all the rules and thus being seen to be holy and being treated to the best seats in the synagogue. You think walking over an unmarked tomb makes you unclean. And so you have a campaign to find them and whitewash them. This is something the Pharisees actually did. Um, but really, it's you who are coated with the whitewash to make yourselves look good. Now, at this point, one of the upper echelon, an interpreter of the law, a lawyer, pipes up. He feels insulted. Um, but I think he really also hopes that Jesus somehow has been having a go at low-level hypocrisy, and therefore it can't really mean him. Jesus puts him straight. Oh, no. This is about you as well. In fact, you're even worse. You interpret the law, and then you apply rules that make serving God an impossible burden. I'm sure your knowledge of scripture extends to noting that this doesn't actually fit terribly well with Jesus' statement, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
More than that, Jesus goes on, you have locked away the truth and thrown away the key, so you can't even see it yourselves, which means that far from guiding people towards God, you are actually guiding them away. Verse 53, when he left the house, um, my version says, the scribes and Pharisees began a furious attack on him. <laughs> As a meal invitation, it's not going well, is it really? Um, eating with Jesus can be a challenging experience. So what would this look like today? The modern church worldwide and here in Winchester and here in WBC. Would Jesus start the conversation with a lass and woe? My apologies for the next bit, because I think he might. And I think they might go something like this. Alas for us, when we spend our time, effort and resources focused on ourselves and for our own benefit and do not prioritise the need for justice and compassion for all. Rather, we should remember that we are called to let justice and righteousness roll down like mighty rivers. Alas for us when we turn the Bible into a weapon and set up rules of our own devising, not God's, so that we can judge who is in and who is out. Rather, we should remember that we are called to be full of grace and truth and leave the judging to God. Alas for us when we turn famous Christians into idols and elevate their successful churches, their teaching programs, their books, their music above Jesus. Rather, we are called to follow the ways of Jesus only. Alas for us when we think we have all the answers to every question. Rather, we are called to be seekers after truth and not appointed as the guardians of it. And alas for us when we try to dwell in the glory days of the past. When the church was full, thriving, the minister was more to our taste, etc., etc. Rather, we are not called to criticize, but to live freely in the present and to be full of that sure and certain hope. Now, all this is by way of saying that Jesus has gone for a meal with the nice religious people of his day. And he doesn't have much, you will have noted, if anything, to say about them in general and their leaders in particular, which is positive. Now, to be honest, I'm actually pretty skilled in the whole hypocrisy thing. Um, I've got some pretty clear ideas about what's good and right and, and acceptable, um, and I was brought up that way. Um, I may have told you this story before, but it fits with the, the theme. So my apologies if you've already heard it. When my grandmother died, my elder brother inherited her television. We didn't have one before that. And so the rule was created that we didn't watch television on Sunday because that was the Lord's Day. And it joined the list of things you weren't allowed to do on Sunday. That is, until the film, The Dam Busters, was due to be shown on a Sunday. And my dad dearly wished to see it. When my brother returned home, my dad was found watching said film on Sunday. And it's fair to say, a family disagreement followed. Um, and to his credit, my dad apologized, actually, and the rule went out of the window, never to return. In our passage of scripture this morning, Jesus really takes the Pharisees to task. Now, I don't think for a moment that any of us would aspire to replicate the behavior of the Pharisees, which Jesus criticizes so forcefully. Although, of course, we do worship the same God. But the Pharisees, in their desire, and it's not a bad desire, in their desire to be right with God, they've lost their way. They wanted people to come to faith. 
But in their enthusiasm to be right, they had made coming to faith a burden and a trial. They were so sure of their own rightness that they had become blinded to their own hypocrisy. Think logs and specks. They had added extra requirements to the faith. Very importantly, these were things that God did not require. And all in all, they were rather pleased with themselves about it. Uh, my friends, when, when I look around at sections of what describes itself as the church today, I can see this Pharisaic hypocrisy. I, I don't think it's exactly difficult. My worry about myself, which I share with you today, is that I know that I am capable of being tempted to be as much a part of the problem as I am capable of being part of the solution. Now, I don't suppose for a moment that either you or me is going to be so faultless and so free from hypocrisy that Jesus would never express the occasional alas or woe in our direction. But here in this passage, we have a helpful list, actually, of some of the temptations that go along with being a nice religious person. And we should note that at worst, these lead to people being driven away from the kingdom of God. How nice religious people behave can lead to people being driven away from the kingdom of God. Let that sink in for a minute. I, I feel we would do well to take on board Jesus' suggestion to his disciples. Um, I would ask you to note that this is shortly before they fell asleep. And he said, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So I'm going to conclude by praying. Um, let's pray for ourselves and our leaders and those we have called to serve Jesus amongst us. And this prayer uses um, scripture as a basis. So let's pray. O oh Lord, our rock and redeemer, may our words and the words of our leaders' mouths and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Psalm 19, verse 14. May you, O Lord, give us and our minister the desires of our hearts and make all of our plans succeed. Psalm 20, verse 4. Lord, our God, may your favor rest upon our elders and deacons and establish the work of their hands. Psalm 90, verse 17. God of hope, May you fill us all with all joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, verse 13. And finally, may you, the God of peace, equip both us and our admin manager, Lois, our bookkeeper, Ali, our elders and deacons, Janet, Gareth, Gordon, Catherine, Ed, Kirsty, Steve, Anthony, our youth worker, Eleanor, our children's worker, Ellie, our senior worker, Carol, and Marcus, our minister, with everything good for doing your will. And may you work in us what is pleasing to you through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Hebrews 13, verses 20 to 21. Thanks.
So we're going to conclude our song, um, conclude our service with a song, um, which asks that God would speak to our heart. Um, and that uh, as we pray and think about the things that the challenge that we've had this morning, um, that we would be we would be open to God's love and to to what God is telling us um, we should be doing. <laughs> Okay, just an administrative detail. Uh, the stewards will come to you and uh, invite you to leave uh, one by one. Unfortunately, we're not able to, to hang around. That said, if there's anybody willing to stay to help move some of the chairs for the music exams, that would be... Uh, Thank you.